To investigate the power in resistors, we once more use a sinusoidal test signal. As we know from the Fourier series, we can use a number of sine and cosine waves to represent any other repetitive signal. And for sinusoidal waveforms, the trigonometric functions come very handy as they are all related to each other, as we will see in a bit. In this case, I define the current through a resistor to be a cosine wave. It has its amplitude, and I define the phase to be zero. That means that the instantaneous power, the power as a function of time, is the voltage across that resistor as a function of time, times the current through that resistor, also as a function of time. And through Ohm's law, we can rewrite that into V squared, the voltage squared, divided by the resistance, or the resistor, times the current through the resistor squared. Putting in the cosinusoidal current into that equation for power, we end up with the expression for the instantaneous power here. Now looking up an expression in a math textbook for the cosine squared of an angle alpha, we can see that the cosine squared of that angle alpha is half times one plus a cosine of twice the angle alpha. Applying that trigonometric function to our case here leads to the power being expressed as the resistance times the square of the RMS current. And in the brackets, we got the cosinusoidal waveform now of twice the original frequency of the current that we applied as a test current through the resistor. Or rewriting it with the voltage, we got the RMS voltage squared divided by the resistor times the same cosinusoidal waveform with the offset of 1. The maximum of a cosine is 1, and the minimum of a cosine is minus 1. That means, together with the offset of 1, the equation in the brackets here reaches its maximum at 2 and its minimum at zero. Ultimately, that means that the instantaneous power in a resistor alternates around the RMS voltage squared divided by the resistance or the RMS current squared times the resistance and can never go negative. Therefore, the average power in a resistor Using the definition of average, that means we divide by the period time t and integrate over a whole period from zero to the period time t of the signal over time means that we get the equations that were outside the brackets in the upper case. And that also means that all of this power is real power and the imaginary power is zero. Plotting these waveforms over time, we have both the voltage and the current of the resistor being in phase, ending at the period time t, and plotting the power at the same time axis with the period time t. We can see that it already starts repeating at half of the period time t, therefore it has twice the frequency the maximum of the instantaneous power are the peaks of the voltage and the current multiplied together. And the average power is the value that the instantaneous power is alternating around. Using a cosine waveform as a test voltage across an inductor with the amplitude VL, we get the current through the inductor as a sine wave and its own amplitude, IL. Equally to the resistor, the instantaneous power in an inductor is the multiplication of its voltage and its current, both as a function of time. Inserting the cosine test voltage from above into that equation and the resulting current here leaves us with the multiplication of a cosine 
and a sine waveform, both with the same frequency omega t, and the multiplication of the amplitudes in front of that. Again, looking up the trigonometric equations, we can see that the multiplication of a cosine with an angle alpha with the sine of the same angle alpha gives us half of a sine of twice the angle alpha. Using this equation here and replacing alpha with the multiplication of our angular frequency omega with the time t, we get the peaks of the voltage and current of the inductor divided by our factor of 2 coming from the trigonometric equation times the sine wave of twice our multiplication of the angular frequency with the time t. In this case, the instantaneous power alternates up to a maximum of plus 1 and down to a minimum of minus 1 with twice the original frequency of the test signals. As that sine wave is centered around the time axis, the average real power of an inductor, which is the average value of the instantaneous power as a function of time, so that means integrating again from zero until the period time t, and afterwards dividing with the period time t, equals zero. Representing those signals graphically means we have our cosinusoid waveform for the voltage here, starting at the peak of the voltage VL, and the sine wave of the current starting at zero and having its peak at the inductor peak current, where those two signals are 90 degree phase shifted from each other, with the voltage being ahead and the current lagging the voltage with 90 degrees, we get the power again at twice the frequency as we are plotting it at the same time axis as on the left hand side, but the power already starts repeating at half of the period time t. Furthermore, all the areas above the time axis, so that's the first positive sine wave from the power and the second positive sine wave of the power are equally big as the areas below the time axis for the first negative one and for the second negative sine wave and that means the average power in an inductor is zero. For a capacitor the math is very similar. Again, we define a test signal, here the voltage across the capacitor, to again be a cosine waveform. As the voltages are ahead of the current with 90 degrees, the current through that capacitor is a minus sine wave. The instantaneous power in the capacitor, again, is the multiplication of the voltage as a function of time, times the current as a function of time, which leads to the exact same equation as we had for the inductor, with the only difference that now we have a minus sign in front of it. Therefore, we can apply the same trigonometric function, means the cosine of an angle alpha times the sine of an angle alpha gives us the sine of twice that angle alpha, and we have to divide by a factor of 2. Applying that equation to the power of our capacitor, we end up the power alternating with the sine wave of twice the frequency as we originally had for the voltage, the amplitude of the voltage across the capacitor, and the amplitude of the current through the capacitor define the amplitude of the instantaneous power divide by a factor of 2, and we get that minus sine wave from the current through the capacitor up here. For the integral that we use to derive the average power in a capacitor, the minus sine doesn't make a difference, and the average power in the capacitor, as we have seen also from the inductors, is zero.
Equivalently, we have the voltage across the capacitor being a cosine wave starting at the amplitude of the voltage across the capacitor and the current now being a minus sine wave and reaching its peak at the peak current of the capacitor. Again, the voltage and the current are shifted by 90 degrees from each other, but in this case, the current is ahead by the 90 degrees, the current is leading. Due to the minus sign for the current, the power also gets a minus sign for its sinusoidal waveform at twice the frequency, which is repeating already after half of the period time t. And the amplitude of the instantaneous power is defined by the multiplication of the amplitude of the voltage across the capacitor times the current through that capacitor divided by a factor of 2. We can also calculate the power in components with phasers. The generic definition of power, the complex power S with the underscore here, is the voltage across an element times the conjugate complex current through that element. And if that element, the component, is an impedance, we can rewrite this equation as the voltage squared divided by the impedance, where the voltage is a phasor, or the impedance times the current phasor squared. Usually, we represented a phasor as the amplitude, the peak of a signal, and its phase for a given frequency. The same for the current with an amplitude of a current and the phase phi of that current. Now applying these equations to the resistor, if we in the first place simply add the index R and we take the voltage across the resistor times the conjugate complex current of a resistor. And now I'm redefining the use of the phasers. Instead of the amplitude of the signal, I use the RMS of the signal for the amplitude of the phasor. And I can do that because, this, because phasors are always sinusoidal signals. They are only defined at one frequency, but it makes it more convenient to calculate the power in a resistor. Knowing that we're dealing with sinusoidal signals, the RMS value of the voltage is the peak voltage divided by a factor of square root 2. And for the current, it's the peak current also divided by square root 2. Now multiplying these two square root 2s together, we get a division of a factor of 2 in front of the power. The argument of the phasor is the phase difference of the voltage minus the phase of the current, where the minus sign for the current is coming from the conjugate complex of the current here. Specifically for our resistors, we have the voltage phase being equal to the current phase. The voltage and the current are in phase at a resistor. The power simplifies to the amplitude of the voltage times the amplitude of the current divide by a factor of 2. We can also write the complex power in a resistor as its real part plus j its imaginary part. And as this equation up here is real only, the imaginary part is automatically zero. That proves that we also through the phasor calculation of the power we have the peak voltage across the resistor times the peak current through the resistor divided by a factor of 2 as the average power in a resistor and the reactive power in a resistor is 0. We can apply the same definition of complex power being the multiplication of the voltage phasor times the conjugate complex current phasor to inductors and to capacitors.
in terms of the inductors, the impedance is J omega L. And for a capacitor, the admittance is J omega C, or the impedance is 1 over J omega C. Now, in both cases, using Ohm's law to express the voltage across the inductor, or down here to express the current through the capacitor, we end up with the multiplication of the current phasor with its conjugate complex in terms of the inductor. And in terms of the capacitor, we have the original voltage over here also getting multiplied with the conjugate complex of the voltage across the capacitor. That means that the arguments of those two phases cancel out and we are left with the imaginary part, the impedance of an inductor and the admittance of a capacitor in these two cases where the inductor impedance is getting multiplied by the amplitude of the current through the inductor squared and in terms of the capacitor the admittance is getting multiplied by the voltage across the capacitor squared. Once again rewriting the power with the real part and an imaginary part so the active and the reactive power in these two cases we end up both of the real parts of the power are zero and we only deal with the reactive power which is defined by the imaginary part of the power here.